<laughs> it always was on. on hey uh, there, guys. We're you. live. We're live there, Scotty. Look. We're live. Okay. I'm we going to shut live. down looking at your computer, Steve. All right. You can shut down looking at my computer. It's pretty a fascinating computer, by the way, guys. But that's actually not the topic for tonight's Bible study is not my computer. So, uh, but stay tuned. We're just warming up, waiting for the top of the hour to come. <clears throat> we'll be starting at 7.30 promptly. Oh, boy. Yep. I, I'm actually I'll, be, uh, I'll be watching the chat, Steve, as well. You are awesome, behind, man. But... You're awesome. I love that. I appreciate <laughs> it. I think, I, I mean, I don't know what to say. All right. So for folks who are out there in YouTube land, I was going to say Yahoo land, but of course I'm a Yahoo on YouTube, not the other way around. So uh, uh, we'll be starting our practical Christianity Bible study about fighting the good fight of faith tonight. Mm. And you can see cool. my friends here. Uh, I know some of you that might throw you off the uh wanted to be on this broadcast but pay no attention to the to the you know we have a statement i grew up with as a child don't judge a book by its cover so we're looking here we're putting that old adage into practice here tonight and after they open their miles it might be even harder but uh but at least at least uh you won't have judged the book by the cover maybe the contents of the book well that's a different story um, but no, praise the Lord. We're just going to have a little bit of fun tonight. And guys, <laughs> given that this is going to be an hour, we're only going to do an hour. Um, <clears throat> I pray the Lord just, since this is our first one, that the Lord in his grace just get our pacing and everything right in a manner that will be pleasing to him. And that will be a blessing to those that uh, participate and listen. Um, and that he would orchestrate our interactions and dialogue in a manner that'll be useful in highlighting points and making it engaging for folks who are listening online. And uh, we just ask all these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So Yeah, this is a long this is a long time fixing to get ready, isn't it, Steve? That it is. <clears throat> well and hopefully we're fixed and we're ready. So we'll see how that plays out here tonight. Um, but uh, it's the yeah. first time running it up the flagpole. I mean, you never know how it's going to wave. <laughs> That's true. Well, you know, we, we talk we talk a lot about different. I mean, a lot about different things. The whole point of this, and I don't want to give away, you know, anything about what you're going to get into when we start, Steve. But for those that are watching which is me and one other person. I happen to know who it is. Um, the, the idea is that there's a reality. It's funny because I do stuff on YouTube on my other ventures. And it's interesting because, you know, keeping it real and, and like looking at real UK use cases of things, whether it's one particular product set stack or a different product stack, you know, people come at it with, these high and lofty words and, you know, whatever, but they don't ever really, well, not say they don't ever, it's not like I've watched everybody on YouTube. A lot of the professional folks that are making a ton of money don't actually talk to like real use cases of things that affect everybody every day. And so the idea of this is that is not dissimilar from what happens in most churches. Sure. I mean, the I'm idea of, practical Christianity is this is a it's an everyday all day thing how do you walk that out what's that look like how do you deal with your boss how do you deal with your wife how do you deal with your best friend how do you deal you know with things that are going on it's and how do you deal with it rightly in Christ um, and that's sort of why I know Steve we've got a lot of challenges uh, we all face, and this is a this is a big part of starting to get to the nitty gritty, real world use case of how Christianity ought to be working in all of our lives every single day. Amen. Amen. You know, it's not about well, how great how great we are or how wonderful we all are or how we all perform so perfectly all the time. It's how the grace of God enables us to 
get through the day in a way that is a blessing to others and glorifies him. All right. So, Rick, I'm almost to the seventh. You're still muted, Steve. Yeah, I was saying I was al I'm almost to the 7:30 mark. So when we hit that, yep. I do. What do I do different at that point? I would go back to the first screen with just you, do your intro, and then introduce us and go go forward from there, Steve. So we're up. I just go to there. It's, we don't have to do anything on yep. YouTube. Okay. Nope, you're live. You're good to okay. go. We're bantering. All right. So we're just bantering. We'll wait. I'm watching the uh, clock over here. So oh, there it goes. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to our first ever Practical Christianity Bible Study. I'm Steve Atherton. Behind me is New Mexico. I'm sitting, though, in South Carolina, but I figured it looked prettier out there and, and everything, and I love being out in the outdoors. So <clears throat> I got a few friends I'd like to bring up, so I'm going to bring them up now. Uh, we've got tonight with us, we got Rick Utzler. Say hello, Rick. Hello, everybody. Yeah, Rick's out in uh, West Texas. That's kind of the West Texas. That's Ministry Ranch out there, not too far from that place in uh, in New Mexico, where I'm there. Scott, uh, I'm not sure Close where you are. You say are. hello. Yeah, say say hello, Scotty. Good evening. There, Scott Stevens. Now, if you didn't notice, he's from another planet, and you'll find that out <laughs> as we get into the uh, into the meeting tonight. And then we got up in Spartanburg, uh, South Carolina. Philip Walthall. How you doing tonight, Phil? <clears throat> Hello, doing fine. You guys are so exciting, man. I am just so excited yeah, right. to be here with you guys. You guys are knocking me out here. All right. <clears throat> so tonight, what we're doing, this is our first This is our first one of these. And it's going to be an hour long, folks. Rick's watching the chat. So if you have questions or anything like that that you want to put up, put them up. And we're going to be doing a whole bunch of different subjects. But tonight, I thought we would study start with fighting the good fight of faith. The Apostle Paul talks about this. He talks about how he had fought the good fight of faith. He was ready to be offered up at the end of his life. You see in 1 Timothy 6 where he tells, he exhorts Timothy to fight the good fight of faith, to lay hold on eternal life. <clears throat> and there's a lot of fighting going on right now in this country. Uh, a lot of fighting by people who call themselves Christians. A lot of fighting uh, people who most definitely aren't Christians. Uh, a lot of fighting on a lot of different fronts. But one of the things is, is that a lot of times I find that we as Christians often don't rightly divide the battle. We lose sight <clears throat> of how God operates. And if we want him to be moving in and through what we do, then we need to fight it the way he would have us fight it, not the way we think we ought to fight it. And there's, we can get in, and we'll probably hit on this subject in a number of different areas as we go through this. But tonight, I thought we would go through, and I'd ask everybody who's watching online to turn to Hebrews 4. And I'm going to switch over to this screen where you can see it up here if you don't have your Bible with you. Um, and we're going to start with Hebrews 4, because in Hebrews 4, the Apostle Paul lays out a perspective on how to fight this good fight of faith as an individual, because you can't fight for others unless and until you win yourself. And when you've won for yourself, now you're in a position to fight for others. And this chapter goes through that very distinctly at a personal level. But in addition to that, the same principles apply when we're fighting on behalf of others or even a nation. Um, so I'm going to let uh, Rick start reading for us here. So, Rick, why don't you go ahead and start reading, and I'll tell you when to stop. Sure. sure. Let, Let us, us therefore fear, fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. All right, let's stop right there. <clears throat> One thing, those of us, I mean, my friends here up here with me, all of us know we talk about Hebrews 4 as having four steps. First step is, let us therefore fear. Something that the church does not tend to have much of a proper fear of God anymore. We're not going to head into that subject big time right now. But step one of the four that are outlined here in Hebrews is let us therefore fear. You're going to see as we get down there, three other steps. Next one, let us labor um, against the unbelief. Let us um, hold fast our profession and then let us come boldly before the throne of grace 
So we're going to be going through each of these. But this first one is really critical. You know, step one, you can't get to step two, three, or four unless you address step one properly. So let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. That's referring to God's rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it. So guys, <clears throat> just talking as four guys here for a moment who everybody here, each of us have been walking with the Lord now, I think for probably 20 years at any rate. Um, Phil, is it 20 years for you yet? You're, you're a youngster amongst us. Okay, I know math's not your first subject, so we'll see. No, well, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking. Uh, uh, you know, I, I guess, I mean, 17. You know, I mean, I think, you know, I mean, uh, Davey, you know, told me the gospel on 17 or 42. Um, I, I received that gospel. Um, yeah, really embracing it. Um, um, really embracing that. I mean, the uh, Lord's been working with me for... More than 20 years, I know that. I can say sure. that. Sure. That's the best way I can put it. All right. So we're talking, guys, just for folks out there in the audience who may not know us, we're talking about people who've been serious about the Lord for 20 years or more. Um, and when I say that, when I say serious about the Lord, I'm not talking about people who, you know, <sighs> People who we've had, people here have had backslidings, people here have had many different things, but fundamentally throughout this period of time has been a knowledge that Jesus Christ is real, that his gospel is true, and that his salvation is our only hope. All right, I think that's true of every single one of us, regardless of whatever issues we may have had. And that's really fundamental to fighting the good fight of faith, okay? So, my question to you is, do you ever, do you seem to come short of that promise of entering into his rest? Yes. Scotty, how about yeah, you? Absolutely, absolutely. <clears throat> okay. I mean, and, the thing is, it's the idea that It's it's somehow amazing knowing myself um, that the Lord is with me. Um, you mean you're not worthy of his being with you? Amen. Uh, and yet, my experience has been that um, he's indeed inhabited my work, my marriage, uh, Friendships even with unbelievers. Um, and is always drawing people to himself. But for, for me, um, I, it amazes me. It, it amazes me uh, that the Lord's grace and love, the consist consistency of that love and that grace, in spite of my inconsistency, which is what I'm concerned about. Right? When I'm fearful of maybe missing the mark here, right? and, and I don't want to, the idea that I might say a curse word or I might have an unclean thought. Uh, I've got all of that going on. And yet, the Lord continues to encourage me in his word, in my walk, in business, in fellowship. And uh, I think for me, the element of the fear is that I might... I might not believe that he's able to be all that he is. Right? I might, I might not be able to see uh, with the perfection that he operates in that that's for me. 
Well, let me throw a couple things out there. I mean, first of all, when you're talking about that, there's a scripture which all of us know <clears throat> says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not on thine own understanding. Acknowledge him in all thy ways and he shall direct thy paths. Now, there's an awesome promise in that. If you will trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not on thine own understanding, but rather acknowledge him in all thy ways, he shall direct thy paths. What you're talking about is the situation. Do you believe him for that? Do you really believe he'll direct your paths? And the answer is, a lot of times you don't believe. You don't believe that will direct your paths, even though he has evidenced that and, and as much of a screwball as you have been so many times, he has been there and with you and keeping you and moving through you. And, Absolutely. And what that highlights here, and I want to highlight a point here because it's going to come up as we read a little farther down in this chapter. It highlights something about our wicked heart and its unbelief and our carnal mind, which is the enemy of God says it's at enmity with God, which means the enemy of God. Right? And that's a battle. You have a battle going on continuously between your cursed flesh and your carnal mind and your spirit, which was created by God, that believes God, knows God is real, has fellowship with God, but your flesh cannot see him, cannot touch him, cannot taste him. And listening to your sermon today, um, it's if it's not being pleased, then there's everything in the world is wrong. Everything in the world is entirely wrong. There's not a single good thing in the world if Scott is not getting exactly what he wants right now. Uh, if he's not getting question. perfectly, if he's not getting everything he it. wants right now, man, done with God, man. Where in the hell are you? What's going on here? And every other thing. Okay, now. I want to hit on this point, though, for a moment of what is it to enter into God's rest? Okay, and this, for those who don't know the book of Hebrews well, if you read Hebrews chapter 3, <coughs> and this is a letter written by the Apostle Paul to his brethren, Hebrews. He was a, he was a um, Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was born of the tribe of Benjamin. He was circumcised the eighth day. You know, he was um, a, as far as being an Israelite and being one that was of a high level, he had all of that, but he did not know Christ. And he had a real heart for his people. In the book of Hebrews, is Paul ministering unto his brethren, if you will, to his nation in their alienation from God in many instances, but also in their struggle to how do we walk? We, we learned the law of Moses, and we're terrified that if we turn from the law of Moses, we're all going to die. Um, or do we walk by the gospel of Jesus Christ, which promises us all, all eternal life? And the Apostle Paul was the living embodiment of the fact that you live by the gospel, not by the Amen. law. Um, which was an amazing thing that that's who he was because he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was the one who, as he said, as touching the righteousness that is in the law, blameless. And yet he counted all those things as but dung because all of those things had led him to the exact wrong conclusion where he was killing Christians rather than serving Christ. Okay. Now, that is... Chapter 3 of Hebrews is all about the people who came out of Egypt with Moses, all right? And it's about the 600,000 adult Israelite men who came out of Egypt with Moses together with their wives and their children and the mixed multitude that came out and how out of that 600,000 adult men, only two entered into the promised land. Only two entered God's rest of all those that Moses ministered to. Pretty amazing. You know, and I think people miss this, the idea that all of Israel came out. Only two entered in. How many people say they believe that Jesus is Lord? 
And how many people walk by faith? Amen. Now let well, me take. Go Scott, ahead, Rick. I mean, I mean, you just go. Look, I. You go to Matthew seven, right? Many shall say unto me, Lord, Lord. They're not going in. Um, and it's it's <laughs> again, it it actually comes right down to this idea of entering into His rest because entering into his rest is you cease from your works. And that whole thing in seven was them about doing, they were doing works, but it was all their works. It wasn't his work. Right. And so you, you're really hitting the nail on the head here. And it's, it's a chronic issue. Um, it's chronic and it's terrifying really. That's why he says, let us therefore fear. Amen. You really think about it. You look up, just look up how many times, Jesus is talking about those that do the will of his father. You know, whether it was the, when his mom and his brethren come to a knock on the door, says, who's my, my, my mother and my brothers and sisters? Those, those here that do the will of my father, right? You know, those that enter in over Matthew 7 are those that do the will of my father. And so that's when you enter into his rest, you can't do that if you're about yourself. Well, it, it's impossible. Mm. Yeah. If you rely on your own works, your own efforts, your own intelligence, your own thoughts, you're going to miss the mark. And well, that's, yeah. what we should, that's what we should be afraid of because it's what we're almost subject to. And what you see here, and I want to hit on a couple points you guys are just mentioning there. Okay, first of all, the scripture says, this is Jesus speaking. Okay, Jesus says, speaking of himself in John 15, he goes, Without me, ye can do nothing. All right, number one. Through David in the Psalms, he says, man in his best state is altogether vanity. That is worthless and incapable of any good thing. He says, over, you know, there's none that seeketh after God, no, not one. There's none that are righteous, no, not one. There's none that are good, no, not one. Okay, so... We see over and over again, the truth of the gospel is the gospel testifies of the extraordinary goodness of God. It does, and it testifies of our extraordinarily depraved nature as man and how yeah. we are entirely dependent on God for everything, our salvation, everything. None of us can save ourselves. Now, why do I bring this up and why is this so important? is see the rest there that the children of Israel were to enter into here is they were to enter in and receive their inheritance in God, in the Lord, which in for the Jews or the Israelites um, at the time of Moses um, and then those who went in under uh, Joshua, that inheritance was the promised land and the distribution of that land to each of them by lot. Okay, so they everybody kind of got their fair share, if you will, um, in that promised land. The reason why they couldn't enter in is because of the giants in the land and the fear of all of these different things. Now, <clears throat> what happened is they had had the experience of seeing God perform miracle after miracle after miracle day in, day out for from the day basically Moses showed up um, through till them passing, you know, escaping uh, the judgment of God on the Passover, where those that had the blood on the doorpost and lentils, the angel of death passed over. All those that didn't, whether it was an Israelite or an Egyptian or what have you, all they were looking for was the blood. If they saw the blood, they passed over. If there wasn't blood, they didn't pass over, and you lost your firstborn. All right. From there through to the Red Sea, where Pharaoh's armies are bearing down on them, and they're like terrified. And Moses says, stand ye still and behold the salvation of your God. And he lifts up his staff. God brings a strong east wind. The Red Sea parts and they go across on dry land, mind you, not wet land. They go across on dry land. And <clears throat> the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night that had been leading them to that spot goes behind them, discomforts pharaoh and his chariot so that they can't catch up to the israelites then when israel is clean passed over to the other side 
they release them and they come after them and then the water swallows them up and the Israelites are dancing with sim with timbrels and stuff like that on the other side, Miriam leading them in praise, the horse and the rider thrown into the sea, a song we still sing and many churches sing to this day, which is a song of that deliverance of the uh, Israelites from the Egyptians. Then they get to the other side and of course, they're complaining and everything, and God provides them supernaturally water and supernaturally food. And he does that for 40 years on that side. But they could never make that crossover from standing in the place where they knew God was real, had observed him, to the place where they believed him for themselves and entered in and received their inheritance. And that is a place many Christians have never entered into is they've never entered into receiving their inheritance in Christ. And the inheritance is, people talk about spiritual gifts and these different types of things. That's all part of the inheritance. And that's where then the church is functioning fully. And that's where, as Jesus said over in John 1, 12, it says, and to such as believed on him, which we're going to get into that here in Hebrews 4, gave he them power to become the sons of God. And he then says he gave us power to tread on serpents and scorpions and all the power of the enemy. Now, people go out here and they look and they're like, well, you know, the mainstream media or the the elites or the deep state or all of these folks, they're all too, all, they're like all powerful. No, they're not all powerful. Not at all. Any one of us have greater power than all of them put together in Christ Jesus. Amen. Okay. Now, the thing is, is that Christ does not work against people's will. And the real problem in America is not with those people. It's the hearts of Americans ourselves. And particularly in the church. All right. And when we come to the place where we realize that without Christ, we are nothing. You know what happens? You have a lot of compassion on those that are without Christ. Because you understand, I mean, I was just like them. I mean, I was woke before there was woke. And I was more woke than the woke folks are. And the Lord managed to reach me 30 plus years ago. Actually, this week, it's 33 years um, since he, (coughs) um, since I received him as my Lord and Savior. If he could save me, he could save anybody. And I I look out here on these things. We don't have to fear these things, but we have to stand strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. We have to lay hold on eternal life, and we have to operate in that victory of God. And if we're not, then we need to fear. Why is it that we are coming short of this promise? All right, and for me, let me just tell you, Any promise, promise of healing, promise of um, provision, promise of uh, spiritual gift, promise of any of the good things of God, to me, if I'm seeming to come short of them, then I'm fearing. Let me just tell you, I mean, the scripture says over in 1 John, he talks about as he is, referring to the risen Christ, so are we in this world. God in Matthew 5 talks about, be ye perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Right? When I look at here, it talks about the works of the flesh, what they are. They're variants, you know, they're adulteries, they're um, idolatries, there's all of these different things. Those are the works of the flesh. If I'm walking in any of these things, then I am still way too active in my own works. When I'm worried about the things, about all the things I need to do for Christ, I am need my conscience purged of dead works because I know I can do nothing without him. If I'm saying so, getting this first point is extraordinarily important to being able to move on. And when you try to skip it or pretend that you're not potentially seeming to come short of something, I can tell you, you're not going to have traction in winning this battle. You got to start at the beginning. You got to start with yourself. 
And you got to start recognizing your own doubts, unbelief, wicked thoughts, the different kinds of stuff that so easily plagues us. You know, as he said, the sin that doth so easily beset us. We got to recognize that these things are real and they are evidences in many instances. I mean, look, our flesh never changes. So the fact that there's a battle from that standpoint, that doesn't mean you're losing. Okay, not at all. Um, but if what you're doing is yielding unto that, then you're losing. Okay. The fact that it, your flesh is the way in which it is, doesn't signify you're losing at all. Um, what talks about Romans, Steve, it says, um, in Romans who, you know, the members you yield yourselves to, and that means your soul, you yield yourself to the to the flesh, the servants, that's who the servants you are to, to that flesh, that carnal nature. We you yield yourself to the spirit of God, then you're a servant of God. That's who you, that's who you are. And he's talking about your soul, the choice that you make of what you want to yield. This thing can feel, this flesh can feel all kinds of different types of ways. Doesn't mean I have to obey what this thing is feeling. And, and I don't have to be subject to what this thing is feeling. Absolutely. And, and, and in fact, I can actually, I have the victory in Christ not to be subject to those things and overcome that. And that's actually what he wants us to have. But we, we can operate in that victory with all these feelings going on. Um, but it doesn't mean that they, they, they have to rule us at all. Right. And that's the key. Stand, and they, we can stand yet in a victory, even though these things might be screaming. So, so yeah. what? Yeah, they don't have to rule us at all. That is the absolute truth. And that's really a key thing is when you know they don't have to rule you at all, then, you know, you fight that fight a little differently. Because you fight it with the... And and that's what God wants. That's what Christ died. I mean, that's why he died. And that's what his provision and his promise to us is. He wants us to be not subject and have those things rule. He wants us to be in that victory. Right. I mean, that's why he died, paid the price, was resurrected, given us baptism is because of that um i mean he wants us to walk in that victory that's what he wants and that that's another that's another um thing we can take hold of and, and that fight that you're talking about this amen rick and it requires, oh, go ahead, Scotty. it requires believing that he is big enough to get this thing done in spite of your fleshly <clears throat> carnal issues that you you overcome by believing he is bigger. He's greater than all those things. It doesn't mean you don't experience them anymore, right? You still have times when you don't know what's going on. You get confused. You may be sad. You may have feelings of depression. Despair. But he is bigger than all these things. And that's really the fight to hold on to that in spite of what we are by nature. But one thing, go ahead. It is is what men of God are here to do. You know, it's funny, Scotty. I think in some ways, you know, if you're trying to look at, you know, why would the Lord save a guy like me and why would he use me in the way in which he uses me? And uh, I remember one guy one time asked Davey, he was from this one church, and he said, well, why did God choose me? He said, you don't want to know. He said, why did God choose me? You don't want to know. Why did God choose me? You don't want to know. He finally said, yes, I do. He said, because you were the most rebellious one in that church. And if God could reach you, he could reach everybody else. And he was like, oh, he was all Amen. horrified and everything. I mean, the funny thing for me about myself is that, before I met the Lord, I didn't even believe there was a God. I was 28 years old. I hadn't ever believed there was a God. I didn't believe there was a God when I was five. I didn't believe there was a God when I was six. I didn't believe there was a God when I was 10. I certainly didn't believe the God when I was, there was a God when I was 18 or 20 or 25. I didn't believe there was a God. End of story. I didn't believe Jesus Christ. I believed he was the least likely thing to be true in the entire universe. So when I came to the Lord, I remember, I mean, you know, that to me, to just believe God, leave everything else aside, just believe that there is a God, 
um, and that he, the gospel is true, which I happened to believe when I received it. I mean, I believed, but it took everything within me to believe and then to hang on to that belief. Um, and it's kind of funny because my old man still not changed. My old man's still that same way. He believes everything about God is ridiculous and stupid. So I have to walk this walk of faith with that as my old guy got to drag around all the time and have to <clears throat> deal with. And so I'm really a living testimony that God is able to do anything pretty much because if he can take a guy who doesn't believe even there is a God and certainly doesn't believe that Jesus Christ and him crucified could be God and transform him into a man of God, there's nothing he can't do. I mean, there is just nothing he cannot do. Now, Rick, read verse two. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. All right. So I'll stop right there. So the gospel that we know, and we refer to as the gospel, most people don't realize it was preached to the children of Israel out there in the desert with Moses. That's what he's saying. For unto us was the gospel preached. That is the Hebrews of Paul's day and age, which was in the time of Jesus and thereafter, as well as unto them, that is those who died in the desert. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. And faith here is like the digestive agent, if you will. It's what digests the same word that can give you tremendous strength and life and health and every other thing you need will kill you if you don't digest it. All right. Knowing of God's word doesn't make you saved. Knowing of Jesus Christ doesn't make you saved. Knowing Steve? Jesus Christ does. Yes, Rick. All right. and just just to reiterate again, you go right back over to Matthew 7 and Jesus says the same thing at the end, right? The guy who sure. hears these words does them. He's like a man who builds his house upon a rock. The man that hears these words and doesn't do them is like a man who's built a House upon the sand. The winds come, the rains come, the floods come. One guy's house is still standing. The other guy's is gone. And great is the loss. That's exactly what you're saying here. And what this hits at, too, is it just hits at the fact that the way of salvation has always been the same. It's been the same from the Garden of Eden all the way through to the present day. So, Rick, I want you to read from 3 to 10. I want to kind of get down to verse 10 because it brings up a point you mentioned before and it kind of completes this first point. Okay, verse three. For we which have believed do enter into rest. As he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached enter not in because of unbelief. Stop right there real Again. quick. Because they didn't enter in because of unbelief. I just want you to see that. Now keep reading. Again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Stop. The For harden Jesus not your hearts there. Just stop real quick. The harden not your hearts right there. And if you go back to read through chapter 3, you'll see that what causes their heart to be hardened is the deceitfulness of sin. All right. And what I want you to understand in that, folks, is the deceitfulness of sin. We were talking earlier about how your carnal man, your flesh, which is cursed, which will not be saved, um, which is uh, 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 contrary to the Lord, your flesh does not believe God, and it justifies you in your doubt and your unbelief. That's what it does. In the carnal mind, it justifies you in your doubt and unbelief. Look, have I ever doubted and been standing in unbelief? I mean, almost every single day of my Christian life, okay? Let me just tell you. I mean, for 33 years, I've had to battle with unbelief and doubt, all right? Um, and just a reality, I have had to battle with that, um, sometimes more than other times, but it's been a consistent element of the battle for me for 33 years. All right. 
Um, but what I have found also in my Christian walk is God never justifies me in my unbelief. He'll have grace on me. I mean, I've seen the Lord have exceptional grace on me and many folks who I know very well in the midst of their doubt and unbelief. I mean, he's an amazing God that way. He doesn't just cast us off because of our idiocy that way. But that is a real reality. And it's what caused the children of Israel who died in the desert, that 599,998 who came out with Moses, who died in the desert. It was because of unbelief. All right. The great majority of people who call themselves by the name of the Lord are operating in unbelief. They don't even realize it. Don't well, even I realize think, look, it. That, what the, the part of the problem is they're waiting for something to feel or some bolt of lightning or for something. They don't understand that a person at the cross where they confess Jesus Christ with their mouth, it's that second part where they determine to believe him and believe that he was raised from the dead. That's the step that so many don't take perhaps because they don't know they need to. Well, it's about big, time they got the message. Yeah, and a big part of that is walking in the, our inheritance as Christians, okay? That's the inheritance for health. That's the inheritance for, I mean, it's how you can tithe. That's how you can give offerings. That's how you can do all the different, it's how you can lay hands on the sick to recover. It's how you can do all things is by faith in Christ, all right? And it's an important element of things. And we struggle with this stuff. The fact that we struggle with it, that God doesn't despise the fact that we struggle with it. And none of us should despise one another for the fact that we struggle with it. But when we deny that that's the truth, that we struggle with it, that's where we fall into a place where now we're closing God off from working with us, really. Because our will is not to go forward in accordance with what his word says. It's to justify ourselves and our doubt and unbelief. Well, and we, we don't want to be church. in that place. We play church. You know, I mean, we, we, in the inner man where that decision is made, I don't know about the rest of you, but I played church way too often. Right? I haven't been in that place of decision where I believe that gospel. I can talk all day, right? Do I believe that gospel, right? And that, for me, that goes back to the first verse where that sword of the Lord cuts. Yep. Do Phil, I you were gonna say something. don't I? And it's a decision, it's not a feeling, it's not a lightning <laughs> bolt. It's none of these things, it's a decision. It's a fight. It's a Amen. fight to even want to make that decision. Right. You don't want you don't want to be responsible for that decision. <laughs> You'll be responsible for being good. You'll be responsible for doing right. These kinds of things. But being responsible to believe God, I myself find that an extraordinary battle. <laughs> Phil, you wanted to say something earlier? Well, you know, you're talking about where you kind of close, you're talking about um, not recognizing these things and not recognizing the struggle. You kind of close the door and what God and God working with us. And it, you know, it reminds me, and I know we're in Hebrews, but this does remind me of First John, you know, where it says, you know, but if we walk in the light, you know, First John chapter one, verse seven, it says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Amen. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. And, uh, you know, that's that kind of came to mind because, you know, it's amazing. It's like, you know, we've kind of talked this, uh, talked about this before. It's like. You know, you just recognize the truth of, you know, your struggle. You recognize the truth of your unbelief before you. You recognize the truth of whatever the case may be. It's like you can trade all that in and you just go to them and say, Lord, it's not a warning. Please help me. Please have mercy upon me. I don't want to receive this garbage. I want what you have instead. 
And it's like trading that old beat up car. We use this analogy. I think it came from Steve years ago to me. So it's like, or Rick or somebody, but you trade in your, your old beat up Pinto that doesn't even run anymore, you know, outside for, you know, the brand new, you know, brand new Bugatti, you know, Veyron, you know, you know, something so far, so far better. Um, and, and you can imagine, but it, it comes into, you know, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Is it, able to cleanse us from all unrighteousness if we just confess those things, re recognize those things for what they are. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's a that's a that's a beautiful thing. And, and the other point of of some of the things, kind of going back full circle, is you know the children of Israel they they enter not in because of unbelief, they believe their own understanding. Uh, they did not trust the Lord, and they 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 hung on to their own understanding way too much. Um, they hung up their un own understanding, period, um, and not and did not trust the Lord. And in his promise, and it wasn't like a presumptuous promise. The promise was the promised land. It was given to them before um, by prophecy. It wasn't something they just came up with. This was uh, preached of old. This was given to Abraham years ago. Um, and and uh, but they chose Hundreds to of rather years before uh, hundreds of years before. But they chose rather to lean upon their own understanding of the giants in the land, all these things, rather than believe what God had promised them. And, um, I mean, if, if you look at that, um, um, you know, you, you, you see a lot, you see a lot of that, um, you know, you're talking about, you know, the Christians, but you see a lot of people leaning on their own understanding rather than what, what the word of God says. Um, and it's something that we all, we, I mean, I know personally, let me speak for myself. I can struggle with because it's, it's, it's real easy to believe what I'm seeing, what I'm feeling, Sure. What things look like, what what the situation appears to be when it seems like an absolute freaking cluster mess before <laughs> you, rather of your own causing or somebody else is doing or whatever the situation may be. Um, and, and sometimes it's worse when you, it's like your own doing. It's like, oh, my gosh, God, are you big enough for this? Yes. Are you sure? I mean, I've really I, I, I blew it. You know, I'm really I'm really messed this up. You sure? Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm much bigger than you, son. You know, and so praise God. And, you know, I'll go, I mean, I'll I'll go to Steve to get reminded of these things. But he is. But look, let's face it. We I mean, we can understand this. I mean, it's much easier to believe what what we see, what we're feeling, what we all all these things. It's it's so much easier than believing what the Word of God is. But man, I'd rather what have what the Word of God has. Then rather than what my own understanding is telling me and what my feelings are telling me, what my own understanding is and what my feelings are telling me is not something I want. I mean, they're, they're terrible. It's not it. God has something so much better. No, I'll show that. No, no, let me show no, That was very good, Phil. But I want to share something with you this way. If you look at the scenarios we were talking about here with just the children of Israel under Moses, okay, let's, let's go through it for a moment because I want to hit on a point that I think a lot of times we miss, and it's really important in the battle. Because, um, okay, Moses shows up, remember, and he comes to the children of Israel, and they're pretty excited. You know, when they see him take the show, the signs, he shows the hand, leprous hand, he shows the, the rod staff turning into a snake, and then back in and stuff. And they're like, yeah, man, he's getting us out of here. Of course, he goes before Pharaoh, and what is Pharaoh's response? Oh, yeah, we're letting you guys out. No problem, man. I no apologize. Problem. I give up. No, he tells them to make bricks without straw. So, it immediately appears to get worse. I don't know about you guys, but there are a lot of times I'll pray. Like I'll pray to get mm -hmm. to, to not be like, I'll feel, I have a sense that sickness is coming on me or something and I'll pray. And when I pray, you know what? I feel worse and I feel like the battle's even worse than it was before I prayed. It makes me almost not want to pray sometimes because it seems to go worse rather than better when I pray a lot of times initially for me on a whole bunch of different fronts. Um, and then, you know, of course they have the Passover and, and the children, they go and they, they borrow of their neighbors, remember, and they spoiled the Egyptians. They give them all these jewelry and all the stuff they need for their journey. And they're like, man, this is great. We're going and we're going. And then they're back up against the Red Sea. Uh, and they weren't really thinking too much about being back up against the Red Sea because they are pretty stupid until Pharaoh's bearing down on them. They're like, oh my God, he brought us out here to die. Right. <clears throat> I'm bringing this up because, see, 
what you're describing, Phil, as it's a lot easier to believe what you're seeing after the flesh is exactly what was going on with the children of Israel. It was a lot easier to believe that it was hopeless, that they were grasshoppers in the sight of the people whose land they were in the promised land. The city's walls were too great. Everything was too great. Right? And <laughs> we, um, unfortunately, that's what happens. And if you're going to rightly divide the word, draw on their example. I mean, their Amen. failure is laid out wide open for anybody to read in the scripture. It was over and over again. He brought it up in the Old Testament. I mean, there's whole Psalms that are dedicated to their screw up in the desert. I mean, whole songs, 112 verses or so of nothing but their screw ups in the desert. Why? Because he wants you to learn from their example, not follow after their example. The fact that we all by nature follow after their example doesn't condemn us. Amen. It's just man. That's all men. That's us. That's them. That's every man that's ever been on the face of this earth. None of us are any better than them. I, I, want, I want to just take a step back. When the Lord sets a blessing before you, when there's a goal, and you believe that the Lord has put that in front of you, and you go after it, the minute you make the decision to trust in the Lord to go after it. That's when the attack comes in. And if you give up and you don't believe, right, you'll never get the blessing. And that's the lesson of all of this. It's the same pattern in and through the scripture and all the people of God. You decide to follow God. The enemy drops a bunch of stuff in your way. <laughs> Right. And you trust God for the blessing. You don't get the blessing. If you go into unbelief and fear and give up. I you can tell you, Scott, going. I have. I have seen that play out. I can't say hundreds of times, but I have seen that play out more times than I can count. Um, I think Dog River, when dad was running Dog River, Steve was a great example of seeing that kind of play out in a business natural thing. But, you know, that business was always about um, preaching the gospel Amen. and demonstrating the gospel. Um, and I've seen it play out a whole bunch of times within with folks that have come and gone in the fellowship. What I don't want to do is see it play out me. <laughs> I, want, I want that to change. I want that, you know, that whole scenario, when it says fear, hook, get real real with yourself in the situation that hard not your hearts is they didn't want to see the reality of what was going on. But if you will, then the Lord can begin to bring you out of that situation and fix it. Well, and that you know. really, I mean, that's, I mean, I think that's it, Rick. I mean, because we get into these situations and we faltered and we've fallen back and not gotten the promise and we, when, what happens? We get dejected. We start to give up. We start to lose faith. We start to lose heart. And the fact of the matter is what the Lord wants to do with us when we find ourselves in that is he wants to rebuild and establish properly our faith aright. Let me give you an example. You know, we have an election like, coming up. I, I, you know, we have an election coming up. And I was just talking about how, you know, when he says he gave us power to <laughs> tread on serpents and scorpions and all the power of the enemy, that, you know, greater is he than is in us and he that is in the world. And all of these promises we have of God. A lot of Christians interpret that to mean, and I've heard many Christians say this, that we're a majority of one as a Christian. And the fact of the matter is they miss a very important point. And I want this point to be very clear to folks. Okay. God, one thing that the Lord does not do is he does not impose his will on people. He honors man's free will. He honors man's free will. When Jeremiah stood against all Israel in the time that Israel was being carried, while well, Judah was being carried away captive, Jeremiah stood in the midst of that, and the words of Jeremiah came to pass without fail. Um, but Judah still was destroyed. 
And Judah was still carried into captivity. And all the things he said came to pass, not because he wanted any of those things to come to pass. He didn't want a single one of those things to come to pass. But they came to pass because they wouldn't believe God. All right. And I say that as we look out here at the nation. Um, it's an important part for us to keep in mind, and it's a really important part for us to keep in mind as we stand out here and minister. Because you do see, after they were carried away captive, you see the Lord move extraordinarily in their captivity. Amen. You see, I mean, the first place you see it, obviously, is with Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. First in interpreting Nebuchadnezzar, well, not eating of the meats, um, the king's meat and being healthier and then giving the dream and the interpretation of the dream and then passing through the fiery furnace. And you see Daniel lived through rulers from multiple different countries, starting with Babylon, then Medo-Persia um, and the like. He went through every one of those different leaders. He was still there and he still had the opportunity to minister. Um, and ultimately, you then see with Esther and um, and Mordecai and the children of Judah um, in that time, and also with people like Nehemiah and Ezra, you see an extraordinary move of God that happened. But it happened because the people recognized that God's judgment of them was just. They were the ones who were wrong. It wasn't that they had been abandoned by him. They had abandoned him. Amen. And and see, and I share this with you because the b biggest part I've seen since 9-11 in America is that my sense is the Christian church has missed that it is us who have to turn from our wicked ways, not the world. And I think for most Christians, it's hard to envision what wicked ways. Well, we've just been talking about any way that is not of faith is sin. I don't care if you're feeding the homeless. I don't care if you're um, helping provide uh, alternatives to abortion to people. I don't care what it is you're doing. If you're not doing it in the love of God and he's not inhabiting it, then it's vanity and it's worthless. And there's so much yeah, that's done not in the, the author name. of it. Yeah, if he's not the author of it, you need to get shed of it. Right. <laughs> and so, I mean, look, I just share this because our force in America, if you will, the spirit behind the church has not been right for last, I mean, since I came to know the Lord, it was one of the big reasons why I believe Jesus Christ and him crucified was the least likely thing to be true in the entire universe was because of my experience of people who called themselves Christians. Um, so, and I share this, folks, I Christian brothers and sisters out there who I know who may be, uh, you know, uh, haven't heard me preach or what have you, and they don't uh, kind of, this might sound strange to them or it might sound harsh or like I'm against them or anything like that. Absolutely not. I mean, one of the things the Lord has really done with me personally, I mean, leave aside anybody else in the universe. I'm just talking about me here for a moment. You know, I was a radical lefty, like I said, woke before there was woke and everything. When I came to know the Lord, and became a radical for Jesus guy and had everybody I knew before reject me. Um, one of the things uh, that happened and in dealing with Christians, because many of the people who rejected me were the people who were Christians before me, so to speak. Um, and they were the people whose their Christianity I had rejected, you follow what I'm saying? And so when I came to the Lord, I was probably kind of tough on some of these folks and, uh, and the like and some of their notions. One of the things I've learned here over 30 plus years of serving the Lord is the grace of the Lord is extraordinary, extraordinary, extraordinary. And a lot of people um, and that I would have written off for one reason or another, God has not written off at all. And Amen. to my Christian brothers and sisters out there, look, there's no shame in us having something wrong or being an error in a thing. I mean, I none of us, None of us like to be wrong. Don't get me wrong. It's not like, oh, I woke up. I hope I'm wrong more today. But my big question to folks who are Christians is, in what universe do you really expect that you'd be right so much? Um, because, I mean, look, we're born entirely wrong. I mean, we're born alienated from God. We're born contrary to God. We're born everything about us is contrary to God. So 
the fact that it would be an unfolding story as we learn to walk with the Lord and come to understand him and know his ways better is uh, it shouldn't be surprising to any of us. Um, and what's that? Well, I was just going to say, and, and there's a great hope in that, you know, I mean, when you, you find out, you, you know, you've been wrong and you know, operating wrong, it's what's the beautiful thing about it is, you know, you don't have to be. Right. Don't have to stay there. And, uh, yeah. I think it was and you who was reading great. the thing about confessed with your mouth. And I mean, you know, if you say you're not a sinner, you lie and the truth's not in you, if you will. But if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive. So praise God. So look, as we go through these things, I hope these will be challenging meetings to you and help you to think through some stuff a little bit differently. But as you do, I mean, first of all, you can ask me a question, anybody, anytime. Anybody out there, if you don't have my cell phone, you're welcome to it. I'll put it out there. Um, Ricky can text, put it in the chat if you want for me. Um, you're welcome to call me. But second of all, I mean, you don't need me. It's not like people are, oh, we've just been waiting for Steve. No, you need Jesus. You need to be right with him, not with me. And you don't need me as an intermediary for you to go and say, Lord, man, I mean, have I been wrong on some stuff? I mean, he'll show you and work with you and help you. He wants... He died on the cross for you. He wants you to be saved. He wants you to be reconciled perfectly unto you. He doesn't want any of us to be lost. I mean, so praise God. You can know that he wants each and every one of us to receive the fullness of the blessing he has for us. So, Rick, I know we're coming up on the um, hour here, so we're going to probably have to wrap it up. And uh, it's gone a little bit different than I had expected, but praise God. I mean, we're you know, we're four guys trying to figure this out ourselves and how to do something that will hopefully be a blessing to you. Um, and I I don't know how well we've done tonight, but we that's what we want. So keep us in prayer. If God can't work through some people who want to serve him and minister unto you effectively, then I don't know what hope any of us have. But that doesn't mean we can't use your prayers. Uh, on our behalf, that we can do something that'll be pleasing to him here, and that'll be a blessing to many other people. So we just finished with verse um, 7, I think, where it talked about harden not your hearts. If you will hear his voice today, harden not your hearts. That hardening your hearts, just realize it's all the justifications. Well, that's not true. That's not like me. Stop that. Just get rid of all that nonsense. Because if you don't resemble some of this stuff, then, man, I, I just want you to know I want to meet you. Because I've been walking for 33 plus years as a Christian, and I have yet to find the person who is walking in this stuff perfectly. So if you are that person and you are the one who, as you're hearing us talk, are like sitting back, wait a second, man, I'm not like that at all. I, I don't struggle with anything. I don't know what these guys are talking about. Call me. And share with me your testimony and your testimony of the extraordinary grace of God with you. And teach me. Amen. Okay. Um, but if you're like the rest of us who sometimes struggle with this, well, stay tuned and let's learn to get past it. So uh, let's get past those notions. That's not me or anything. Of course it's you. <laughs> I mean, let me just say that. Of course it's you. I, I seem to come short of it. I mean, I fight all the time. I mean, I probably fight more than most of you have any idea of fighting. And I fight and I fall short of it. And it angers me. It infuriates me. All right. Um, so, look, I mean, uh, it's just a reality. All right. But praise God. I mean, the Lord has been exceptionally full of grace to me and kept me and moved through me to minister unto many and help them win this fight. And that's what my goal is for you, is to help teach you how to win this fight. Because um, it, it's a fight. It's a knock down, drag out fight. So pick up from verse 8, Rick, and read through to 10. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that has entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. All right, stop. First of all, for folks listening out there, read the rest of this chapter. We may pick up and finish this next week. I don't know. We will see what happens. But this verse I want to hit on here for a moment. We began with, let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. 
Here it says, he that has entered into his rest, has, he also has ceased. No more works of your own from his own works, as God did from his also. It means you don't do a single work. The perfect example we have of this was Jesus Christ when he was walking on this earth. He said he did nothing of himself, not a single thing ever, <clears throat> ever. And he was pretty busy, folks. But that's because his father was busy. And he was about his father's business, not his own. And the works he did were not his own, but were his father's. That's who we as believers are to, that's how we are to be. Every other religion, including false Christianity, every religion's about the works man does to please God. True Christianity is entirely about the work that God did for man, Amen. including this work. So we're going to have to say sayonara for tonight. We've hit the hour mark. May the Lord bless you guys. I hope this has been a blessing to you. If you like us, you know, give a thumbs up or whatever you're supposed to do on a YouTube channel. Um, we'll be back here at the same time next week. God bless you guys, and thanks for joining us, um, fellas. Steve, don't end it yet. Go ahead. All right. Now switch over. Hold on. Switch over to Minicam. Yep.